Zoom. Okay, so I see people are coming on. Welcome to our webinar on co-parenting and teens. I'm Susan Regan, this is Beth Kowaja, and Hi. we'll be introducing ourselves a little bit later. Um, but we wanna just start out with letting you know how to use this uh, webinar. So um, I hope you have something handy to write on or even dictate um, or write into your phone notes uh, because this is a real time of reflection. We know that you have many different ways to spend your time. And we realize that you're probably coming here because there's something that you wanna work on or look at about raising your teen and co-parenting with um, your ex or a former person that was important to you in your life. and um, we want you to come with this idea of how to use our group and what, what your why is. Like, why are you here? What are your obstacles? What are your challenges? Um, and let's just take some time to reflect. I think taking a little bit of time to focus on how you're doing, what you're doing, and why you might be feeling a little off-centered by how your life is going with raising your teen. This is just a good moment to like, okay, what's working, what's not working? Um, we're going to be presenting different topics, and then taking a moment to give you an exercise of reflection. Uh, there's also completely, you're welcome to write in the chat a question you might have, and we will um, be going through those questions. We have questions that were already um, sent in of people who are gonna be listening to the recording, so we'll be reviewing those as well. And we just want you to feel completely welcome to use the space in this way the way that we can't show up for you is we can't listen to your individual stories. We're not gonna be introducing each other to each other, except we'll introduce ourselves to you um, because we we know that there's other ways that you can access us if you have more um, thoughts or you really wanna run a few of your scenarios by us and get our expert opinion about that. And there's also lots of other ways to be involved with workshops and groups that we're running. So all of those links are below. But welcome to our talk on co-parenting and teens. And um, I'm gonna have you introduce yourself first since I've been doing all the talking so far, Beth. Sure. So hi, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here and that we can take this time together to talk about what is such, to me, an important topic of how to co-parent teens. So in terms of introducing myself, my name is Beth Kawaja. I'm a marriage and family therapist and I practice in Los Angeles, where I've been practicing since 2001, which doesn't feel like as long as it sounds. Um, prior to that, uh, my background was in law education with a focus on how do we um, construct rules to sort of best serve the interests of children and child advocacy. And so that really blends for me so nicely with this work on how do you co-parent kids? It's really, you know, children are sort of everything in terms of our society. So how do we build a world that that works best for them? And that my, the sort of hybrid between psychology and law for me has always been incredibly interesting. Um, in terms of teenagers specifically, my training uh, as a therapist was in many different areas, one of which was in residential care with teens. And so I did a teen girl specifically. I've done a lot of work with that. And in my private practice, I work with um, people of all ages, but I work with a lot of teenagers, both boys and girls. And I'm also the parent of an 18 and 20 year old. So I have experience on both ends of the, of the room on this one. Mm -hmm. Well, great. And, and if you've been following me, you know that um, a little bit about my background, but I'll just give a brief background. Um, so I am also a marriage family therapist. I'm licensed in Massachusetts and California. I'm a certified mediator. I run lots of groups helping families transition into two family systems when they're getting divorced. Um, and uh, other things to note about me is that originally Beth and I knew each other through an organization that I founded that was called Bay Area Children First. And I worked a lot, we worked a lot with families and mainly the reason why I started my whole divorce road of helping families was I was helping kids um, go through divorce in their families. And I really love the motto of I like families to think about this as a transition, not a trauma. And every developmental age can be a transition, not a trauma. And so part of why we're focusing on teens is that um, uh, I know I find in my practice when I'm working with helping families separate is that um, the teenage years are a, a little bit challenging because there's a lot going on for the teenager 
during this massive time of transition in their family, they're also transitioning. So we thought we'd hone in to teens to just see if we can augment some of your thinking and get you to um, find different ways to help them through this time. And just to add, Susan, I was remembering that actually when we started working together was 1998, if you can imagine. So it's been many, many, many years yeah. <laughs> with a big gap in between, but still wonderful sort of full circle, which is nice. Right. That's that's true. It's amazing. Long time. But yes, good to good to keep working together and evolving. So you'll see us having this kind of different styles, different approaches to things. And we're going to be showing you how to collaborate just as we kind of learn how to collaborate with each other as we continue to work together in the online communities that we're creating. So thanks for being here. Okay, so where are we starting off? We're starting off with parenting. So yes, actually our first <laughs> our first thing is your exercise. So if you haven't already done it, take a minute to just jot down some of the reasons why you're here today. And if you're listening, why are you listening? What is the thing that you're struggling with? What's your obstacle? What's your challenge? Um, what's something that you want to look at in yourself? Yeah, I think that's just and just before we jump into the exercise, it is so important because Susan and I have tons of experience in this and we'll talk about different things, but I, I really would encourage you to take this minute, reflect on why this discussion today is important to you specifically and how you want to apply our information to your needs in this moment. Yeah. So we are really going to be quiet for one minute. And sometimes it's great in your day to just find one minute to be quiet and think about what you're doing. Yeah. We're going to do it too. Okay, so coming back, um, we're going to give you some information about teens. And yeah. that's, that's going to fill us in. Yeah, and I'm always so happy to talk about teenagers. And I was saying in our podcast, <coughs> excuse me, so I don't want to be overly repetitive, but I'm going to repeat some of it because I think it's really important, um, that I think societally we view teenagers as this age period in which um, it's sort of a, a black hole of human development that we are fascinated by children and love children. And then adults, of course, is where we are. And that adolescence is something we wait out until it's done. And, and I, I so want to counter that. And if there's, you know, a key message or one of the key messages to get from today, it's that teenagers are growing so rapidly. Their brains are growing just as rapidly as when they were children. They actively need parents. They're not adults in young bodies. They really are developing stage of, of the human lifespan in the same way that children are in the same way that when they were little. So I was saying to Susan earlier, you know, we have this view of, we tend to, you know, when we have this adorable little toddler who makes a mistake, who scribbles over the line of the paper on the table, we sort of think, oh, that's cute. It's our job as a parent to teach them how to stay literally color within the lines. With teenagers, the task is exactly the same, even though they're older and the, their, their, you know, sort of cognition is more advanced, so they sound more grown up, they can argue with us really articulately, but it's so important to remember that they're still kids and they need you to really be the adult in the room whenever and however humanly possible. Um, that becomes really challenging when you're co-parenting because you have parents sort of at different homes who don't necessarily agree on things, so you're trying to deal with this vital stage of human development um, without necessarily always being on the same page and without always necessarily having a cohesive front and how to deal with it with your child. And that can certainly make it difficult. So you have a teenager going through this huge stage of developmental growth while your family is also trying to manage this whole transition. It's a lot of change. And the sort of, as the saying goes, you know, teenagers kind of want to launch off as they move into adulthood, adulthood excuse me, from sort of a firm foundation, you know, from, from bedrock and not quicksand. And so trying to manage that while you're managing all of your own feelings about, about this new family structure is 
arguably really difficult. So when we look at what actually is happening in adolescence and it's sort of to nutshell what I talked about before, you have this rapidly growing brain. It's you know an amazing statistic. It's the second fastest time of brain growth in the human life, second only to infancy, which people are always shocked by. So that zero to three where you're learning to do basically everything, um, not everything, but walk, talk, go to the bathroom, you know, do all those kinds of things is that, you know, is, is more development than you have in adolescence, but adolescence is second to it. So if you think about how much growth is actually going on between those sort of early middle school experience, right through college, it goes till you're 26. It's your brain is just transforming. Plus you're flooded with hormones. Plus your body is changing so quickly. We sort of forget that. But, you know, if you look at a, an 18 year old boy, as I often do in my office, and I sort of remind them, what did your body look like three years ago? And they're like, oh, well, I was six inches shorter and I was 50 pounds smaller. And, you know, it's a dramatic change in so many ways as teenagers develop through these years. They really need us right there with them. And so we pull the lens out slightly on adolescence in terms of not only what's happening specifically to an individual adolescent, but what's happening on the larger picture of, picture of our world with adolescents, I think that we're getting a message quite strongly that we really need to pay attention to this developmental period. Um, you know, without going on a tangent about how terrible things are, because I don't think things are terrible, we do need to understand, you know, suicide rates are up dramatically with teens. 10% of people of adolescents um, are attempting suicide not thinking about suicide, but actively attempting suicide. 10%, that's a huge number. Every two hours, an American teenager commits suicide. So mm. this is those are scary, scary numbers, right? And, and we saw a dramatic change starting around 2008, possibly linked to the housing crisis and economic crisis that happened in 2008. Um, so you see a lot of stressors on teens. And at that age, we also got into the social media sort of takeover that occurred. Before that, we were largely on flip, flip phones or much simpler phones. Between 2008 and 2010 was when there was this sort of 50%, even some statistics have it at 60% increase in suicidality in teens. You see a massive increase in anxiety and depression in teens. 36% um, of college kids are being treated for anxiety, 30% for depression right now. Um, our largest age group of, risks is of risk is 10 to 14 year old girls, which is staggering. I mean, that's really little when you, that's middle school girls in terms of suicide and mental health problems. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have all kinds of subgroups of very high risk under that, like, you know, uh, kids of color are at much higher risk, kids in the LGBTQ plus community are at much higher risk. Um, we're really struggling with our young people, or I should say they're really struggling. So I think that when we understand that context, that our world has changed dramatically since 2008, and I know as parents, we like to think, oh, well, the world's always been changing. It's always hard to be a teenager. The changes that have come post-2008 are not like anything that have come before when you look at um, the environmental crisis, you look at the influence of social media on kids, you look at the massive, aggressive um, work by the pornography and, you know, industry to target our young people. They're facing things that really prior generations, I would argue, have not had to face. And we're seeing it in their mental health and seeing it in their suicidality. It's really scary as a parent. So that to me adds extra weight to the conversation that we're having today in terms of how do we really be there for our kids? You know, the good news is that four out of five kids who attempt suicide gave very clear indications prior to attempting suicide that they were going to. Now, one in five doesn't, but still four out of five said something or did something clearly before attempting suicide. And that's the great news for parents in the sense that our kids really do want to talk to us if we're there to listen. So one of the you know key questions, of course, is how do you let your kid know that you really are there to listen? And how do you make sure that that's the priority in the face of a rapidly dividing family in a divided home? How do you make sure that you're there for them? Right. And, it, and, and again, like the, the, the um, percentiles that you gave us, and, and it's not a, a scare tactic. It's more of let's, let's really open our eyes to this and, and let's really to pay attention to our teens. And it's difficult because um, for a number of things where our lives have changed a lot too, 
with since 2008 and definitely during the COVID period of time. But also if you're going through a divorce or in a divorced family, your life is also changing. So I, I liked what you said, Beth, which was um, there's so many changes going on for the adolescent. And then we're also changing the, the family system. So how can we stabilize them? And um, we come back to the idea about stabilizing your kid in your relationship with them. Yes. And that's one of the ways to do it. Um, so the exercise that we have for this section around teens is to really look at are your orientation of who you were as a teenager and how you were parented and also your co-parent, because sometimes that's the orient you know, orientation we're coming from. And we need to really switch that out and and adapt to what our teens at this 2024 need. What do they need in the world that we are living in today? So. I want people to take a minute um, to to talk to to write down or think about the parenting you received when you were a teen, and maybe even just a snapshot of like, oh yeah, I remember myself at the age of my of my child or the the teens that I'm raising. So take a minute to to think about that for yourself. And um, I want to bring in the, the question, one of the questions that we were emailed, just because I think it's relevant to what we just have been talking about before we change subjects. Um, and so the question is, how has the parenting model evolved from our childhood to now? And what are the key differences that parents should be aware of? It's a, it's a great question. How has the parenting model changed? I think that, you know, some of this I can talk about just sort of from my own experience as a therapist working with teens, but also from all, there have been so many studies on this that sometime in the 1980s or 90s, for reasons that I don't know how to explain, we developed as a culture to become fearful that something bad was going to happen to our children. And I think that that's where a lot of the fears around somebody's going to steal my child or somebody is going to hurt my child or they're going to get hit crossing the road, all other things which theoretically can happen, but the chances of it are actually extremely low. But as a, as a nation, I think this culture of fear around parenting evolved. Um, and then we started seeing the rise of television. And so the stuff started to be promoted everywhere that parents felt like they had to protect their kids in a way that previously they hadn't. So the idea of kids being able to go out and play and take risks and run around by themselves in neighborhoods started disappearing in around the 80s or the 90s is when we started seeing that going away. <clears throat> Interestingly, around the same time, we started seeing anxiety rates going up a little bit. Part of the function of childhood and adolescence is this freedom to go and explore and to play and to be able to engage in some thrill-seeking behaviors, some risky behaviors, and being able to master those things and to come through them okay, what we found is that that really calms this anxiety development in kids and in teenagers. So you had that evolving where parents got more and more scared and more and more sort of containing and this more very like, intentional parenting around making sure your children are safe um, was on the rise from the 80s, 90s, right through. And then as we saw the introduction of social media and technology and that aspect, you see this massive change that I was referencing a minute ago, post about 2008, 2010, where you had these kids who had been un, sort of underprovided in terms of their autonomy and their ability to just run around the world. And then we add to that the social media piece, which brings with it this whole piece of judgment of bullying on social media, um, of kids really limiting themselves even more from what I would describe as like 3D actual live interaction. So now they're not only living in a world where everyone's scared they're going to get stolen, but suddenly they're lost down the rabbit hole of social media, which is telling them they're 
not largely telling them they're not good enough or these are the most important things that they should be doing that they're not necessarily doing. So the doubt and the anxiety starts growing and growing and growing. So from a parental perspective, we see these big changes of the massive increase in parental fear occurring. Up until then, we have loss of a lot of parent control, even further parent control, as mm -hmm. social media starts taking over our kids' lives. Um, so there have been many different reactions to how parents have handled this, but I think I have so much compassion as a parent and for the parents I work with that it's incredibly hard to try to be the best parent you can in the face of all of these changes, in the face of your kids being you know, completely absorbed by screens for, I think on average, if you, it's five to seven hours a day that teenagers spend on social media in America on average, which is kind of remarkable. And that doesn't include screen time doing homework or during the day or on anything else, just on social media. It's a huge influence over your teens. So I think that what I see is that parents are really lost and confused and don't quite know how to bump up against this because we also know that the best thing you can do for your teen is provide them with a lot of social interaction. And that only seems to come through screens these days. Certainly we over pandemic, it was all there was. And then post pandemic, it's unfortunately remained the largest way that teenagers interact. So, you know, when I was a teenager in the eighties, there was a lot of time spent talking on the phone. That's really been replaced by all through Snapchat and Instagram and the social and TikTok, the social media platforms. And, and I think that there is just this really challenging dilemma, which I hear parents asking me all the time, should I eliminate the social media? And of course, if we look at social media stats and teenagers, the answer is unequivocally yes. Here's the problem. You eliminate social media, you also really eliminate your child's social life, which is the primary mm -hmm. thing they need to be bolstered from an emotional perspective. So it is not easy. It's a tough question. And I think that the answer is really lies in what you referenced earlier, which is this foundational relationship that you have with your child, being able to have conversations with them, to be able to talk to them about the way social media is impacting them, to be able to talk to them about whether they can perhaps self-regulate their own social media use out of an understanding that actually it's not long-term a positive thing for anybody. Um, I think that it is essential that that relationship be be built on an ongoing and, and intentional basis, mm -hmm. given, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that we do have teens in crisis and we are facing this whole other world of exposure that prior generations didn't have in terms of their online life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, you know, distinguishable what you're saying is that the just the difference of parenting. And um, so I'm not going to go into the second question, but I'm going to say the second question out loud that just came through which was like to look at the difference between how you were parented to how you're being challenged to parent right now. And then we get into the, the our next um, section that we were gonna talk to you about, which is co-parenting. And so um, of course, you know, the best um, co-parenting situation is two people who are really highly invested in um, raising their children in a different parameter outside of the romantic or relationship or marriage. And so we say, yes, that's a good focus to have, but then we know if you're in this situation, how um, how much you have to go through to get to the point of a separation. And there's tension that comes along with it that you're that you're needing to, to let go of. So we know these tensions, right? The tension is how the relationship ended, um, the impact of um, that tension on the children, the continued impact of the tension on the children. Um, and some of what I advise people to do in the co-parenting relationship is to really look at their part of what they have to heal so that they can um, minimize their contribution to the tension. Because I always find that when I'm working with co-parents that the tension between the parents is such a distraction from parenting. It's mm -hmm. it's just an obstacle. And sometimes the, the tension in the between the parents also allows the child to manipulate both parents. And sometimes there's one parent that really um, rules the roost, so to speak, and that other parent really needs to catch up in the parenting relationship. So we see all sorts of, of um, combinations of co-parenting after a divorce has happened or after a separation has happened. And I think some of the things to remember, what were some of the things we talked about to remember, um, Beth, do you, do you have some that are coming to your mind as I'm speaking about this? 
the, I don't want to go on a tangent. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. Tangent away. Uh, in terms of remembering things, I mean, well, what as I'm listening to you, that the the thing that I want, I think, is so important to make clear is that as you've come through all of the trauma is a strong word, but all of the emotional challenges, let's say, of separation or divorce. Um, I don't think that what we're saying is that you have to be a fully grounded, perfectly at peace person to be a good parent. I think that that it's really important to distinguish that from what we're what I think I'm hearing you say and what I would say, which is that you have to work on being grounded on this subject when you're with your child. So it's within your parenting. The task is what do I need to do as a as a parent to be grounded and present with my child as opposed to how do I become an entirely grounded and, and calm person about this subject overall? You don't need to be. Obviously, this is a crazy huge change to be going through a divorce or to going through a separation. It's expected that you're going to have your feelings. But I think that what is so important is to understand that your child's feelings in this moment need to be prioritized and that that requires that you ground yourself mm -hmm. and that you become available to their needs as a parent by being grounded when you are with them. Does mm -hmm. that am I making sense? So that you're yeah. being grounded within yourself. It isn't. It isn't about expecting that you're completely zen at all times about it. It's that understanding the impact that the emotional residue from this experience, what that residue can do in terms of damage to your child, and being right. constantly vigilant about monitoring that emotional residue from the divorce. Right, and I think it's also lab labeling the things that are offsetting in the parenting relationship and understanding them and how much control over that you have over them, different parenting styles, how that parent is moving on, what their household is like, how many routines and structures that you have in place in your home are gonna be done in their home. And, and, and of course, this is like, this is just a snap, a very small look into this. We know that this, these, that every single thing I brought up is a bigger issue. And we could talk for about that issue with individual people's um, situations for hours, right. To try to figure out how to do it better or strategize. And one of the concepts I think, and this is the exercise for this section is to think about the idea about keeping your child in the center versus keeping your child keeping your child in the middle. So a lot of times there's just con this thought of that the child's, the children are in the middle of the parents who are separating, right? And that somehow, um, especially in the teen years where there is this practice of power and using power and having power that we don't wanna give the children too much power at this time, but we want to hear what they have to say. So keeping them in center means we are hearing what they have to say but the parents are also figuring out what they're gonna do. So if one child, for example, wants to um, live with one parent versus another parent, we're hearing what they have to say, but we're also figuring out how is that, that child gonna have some kind of connection with both parents. It might be really out of the box thinking. Um, so one of the things I want you to think about in your situation is in what ways is in your family, are you keeping the child in the center? Meaning you're considering what they might be going through, their personality, what they might be struggling with versus putting them in the middle, meaning that they that they are very much um, getting almost the opinions of both parents, like too much information. They know too much information. They've got too much of the inside scoop of the tension of the parenting system going on. So I wonder if you could say that in a different way, because want to make sure that that's clear middle versus center. And it's, and when you, when you described it to me earlier in this center versus middle way, I was fascinated because I think conceptually it's, it's so accurate. It's really complicated too, but so much of this stuff is when you're talking about co-parenting teens, there's nuance to all of it and complexity. And I think center versus middle sort of is a nice synopsis of, or a nice example, I should say of, of many issues uh, in this whole subject that are complex. So as I see it, and I, if I'm understanding it correctly, when you're putting your child in the middle, which is something we hear about often that parents are not supposed to do, do not put your child in the middle. And it's true. What that means is don't entangle them in conflict. Don't, don't um, invest in conflict with them, if that may, not directly with the child, but with your other parent through the child. Don't utilize your child as a middle person um, to sort of uh, either manifest or enact or solve conflict with your other, with their other parent. That's where I think you start falling into the potholes. Putting your child at the center, I think is really 
um, as we discussed earlier, about the best interest of the child. It's really setting, and some of this goes to your own self-regulating. How do I step back and say, what does my child really need in this situation? Have I had an honest conversation with my child about this in an age-appropriate way? And it's not that kids get to decide everything. That's not great either. But have I really listened to my child about what their needs are? Have I really um, paid attention to what's going on emotionally for them and what is going to make them happier and allowed my needs to step back into second place. And then what those needs are that are truly in the best interest of my kids, sort of emotionally, physically, financially, and in every other way, how do I make sure that that happens? So it's putting those interests, your kids' really best interest at the center, which is totally different than in psychology terms, what we call triangulating, which is mm -hmm. in a conflict with your ex-spouse, entangling your child into that conflict, which is putting them in the middle. I, I don't know if that makes it any. No, that's right. That's exactly right. So if um, if participants or who are listening want to just take a minute to think about that, um, and you might be doing that even in your hierarchical system, if you're raising your child in your home now with another person, another caring adult present, like how do you put them in the middle versus keeping them in the center? Okay, so we're um, going into our next topic, which is about aligning with your teens and how to do that. Yeah, which is the most important thing as I've sort of like, I'm such a broken record on this. I think that the best tool that you have is your relationship with your child. And I think that parents get sometimes understandably very lost in ideas about um, that it's the rules that are the most important thing or that it's it's some external thing that's so vital. Really, at the end of the day, your relationship is absolutely the most important thing. And this is, so I guess begs the question, how do you build your relationship with your child, right? And when we talk about the crisis that I would argue our teens are in right now, when we look at the mental health rates and we look at all of the things that we've talked about today in terms of our teenagers, what do they need from us, right? And so if we look at... Um, what's missing for them in their lives, mm -hmm. and what they need to handle the challenges, the abundant challenges of being a teenager, really it goes down, it, go, it comes to empathy, it comes to communication, being seen, being heard, having a safe place, having live interaction with other humans. Um, so in terms of how do you align with your kid, I think it go, goes to reminding yourself that Punishing them is not helpful. Getting, you know, furious when they break a rule is not helpful. Understanding that these are humans in progress of becoming adults. They need to make mistakes. They need to do things that are, that is appropriate. If they don't do any of that, you're just going to see greater and greater anxiety. So we expect teenagers to make mistakes in the same way that we expect toddlers to make mistakes. You have to be there for them, listen to them, talk to them ground yourself when your own anger or rage comes up. And this is not me saying you can never be angry with your teen. It's not that at all. But I see a much higher rate of reactivity amongst parents with adolescents because there's some expectation that they're supposed to know how to toe the line. They're no, supposed to know how to get it right. And you know, you said something really powerful earlier, Susan, which is so if you can think of your teenager as that adorable little toddler when you're talking to them, it's hugely helpful because they're not, I mean, they're bigger, but they're not that much more advanced. They're parts of their brain are. So some of their abstract thinking and some of their conceptualization skills are as sophisticated as they will be when they're 40. But, you know, their prefrontal cortex is hugely underdeveloped. They can't plan things terribly well. So, well, you know, you're getting mad at them because they're not making plans with their friends in a way that allows you to plan your day. Understand that their brains aren't fully equipped to do that. And they're not trying to be annoying. They just don't actually know how to make a plan that's sort of coherent. Or when they do something impulsive, they're not trying to make your life complicated. Their brains are rigged to be impulsive. They're not, that hasn't developed yet in their brain in terms of how to contain their impulses. And they're supposed to be taking risks and they're supposed to be doing these things that are challenging for you as a parent. So to really remind yourself that this is a developmental stage. And so then you align with your child, as I like to think of it as sort of coming alongside them 
asking questions, lead with curiosity. Don't lead with a lesson and a punitive measure. Lead with, I just want to understand, like, so what's going on? And tell me, what do your friends think about this? And what do you think on this take? Kids also, because of this brand new ability to think conceptually and to think in the abstract, love getting into the macro issues. So they're going to love to talk to you about the bigger implications of be it of social media or the politics or whatever it is. I mm -hmm. would hook into that. It's because that thinking is new to them that it's really exciting. And it's where we get the stereotype of sort of like the politically extreme 18 year old. That's not a fluke. That's because that part of their brain just suddenly grew. And it's very exciting for them to think about all these things that they couldn't think about five years ago. Engage with them in any way that you can on how are they thinking about things. Can you read a book that's the same sort of book that they're reading that feels interesting? I would encourage parents to get on the social media and look at the way, look at the, who, what your kids' friends are posting, not because you're trying to judge it, but just understand, you know, it can be helpful. So I'll have parents say to me, it's crazy. My teenage daughter, you know, refuses to wear a bra and is wearing crazy clothes and go on social media. And if all of her friends and everybody in the world is doing that too, step back and understand maybe that's a new fashion trend and I need to sort of embrace it and understand it. And it doesn't mean that you need to think it's great necessarily, but you need to understand your child is part of a different generation and is going to have different norms and different ideas about things and to be fascinated by that. Again, it doesn't mean you have to love all of it, mm -hmm. but I yeah. just so encourage you to really lean into your curiosity and that's how you align with them is to try to understand what this next generation values, what they think is important. And if you disagree with some of it, engage with them in the way you would another adult and that you're almost sort of saying, explain, let's talk about this, explain it to me, as opposed to, I am now going to lecture you on why what you think is wrong. That's not a winning strategy with it. Right. And one of the questions that just came up was the, the idea about, um, you know, how can I do this without being intrusive? Because in a way, what, what you're talking about is that it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a magical formula, like almost like hurry up and wait, almost like, you know, um, there is so much propensity for distancing versus like connection. And so yeah. how can you approach this inside of, in a way that doesn't feel intrusive? So I, and it goes back to what I was saying before in terms of engage with them, ask questions, let yourself be the sort of, I don't think that asking questions is ever intrusive. And I mean, unless you're asking sort of questions, use your gut. I mean, you know, as an adult, what's a totally intrusive and inappropriate question, but there aren't many, frankly, with your teens, they're still your kids. I would ask them the questions and if they don't want to answer, then that's okay. And you can reflect back to them. It might feel uncomfortable to be telling me this stuff, that's okay. I respect that too. To let them understand that you do respect that as they be, are becoming adults, they're allowed a degree of privacy. And I believe they are allowed a degree of privacy, not total privacy, mm -hmm. but a degree of privacy. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you start early enough and you foster a kind of open discussion whereby your kids feel like they can talk to you about things and that they're not going to be reprimanded or judged, and that ultimately you have their back and you're there with them and for them, I think that the issue of intrusion becomes less problematic, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. It's like if you have a healthy right. relationship with a friend, you know how to have a conversation with them and you know what's a weirdly intrusive question and what's an appropriate sharing and open and honest question where you both feel safe being vulnerable. I also think it's important to, to be honest. Like we talked a little bit earlier about like kids being, um, teens being mean and saying mean things. Um, yes. and to it's come up. So mean. Yes. And I, I mean, I just like a funny example. I was talking to this teenager who was having a conflict with her mother. And I said, do you mind if I, this was many years ago. And I said, do you mind if we bring your mom in for a session and maybe we could try to understand what she's thinking. And I expected her to say, please don't, please don't. She was like, yes, that would be the best thing ever. Please bring her in. And I was like, okay, you sound really excited about that. And she's like, yes, I think my mother is a steel plate in her head. And I'm hoping that if you bring her into session, you can confirm that she has a steel plate in her head. I was like, that is so mean. This poor mother who was a perfectly lovely woman just trying to do her best. But it was a sort of such a little, you know, encapsulation of how actually mean teenagers can be. And I think it's important to understand, again, they've got new language skills, they've got new humor, you know, and their humor has jumped up a level. They haven't figured out mm -hmm. where the limitations are on humor in terms of kindness. You know, this is, they they haven't fully nailed all that stuff. This is all right. new. And part of individuation is having a lot of opinions about other people and how they are and 
seeing your parents for being these flawed individuals. And that helps people, that helps teens separate. But the, yeah, the exercise of this section is to think about how to do your own self-regulation around this, because there's nothing um, worse, I think, than taking it all so personally, right? And as another way of distancing or another reason to distance the teen to distance from you. And that the your self-regulation can sort of mimic or be contagious to their self-regulation, yes. right? So, so we we're both going to kind of come into how to do self-regulation. What is self-regulation? For me, the way I think about it is to actually pause for a minute, like we've been doing with our exercises here, pause for a minute, just right now, think about what's going on in your own head. Think about what's going in your body, on in your body. Where are the areas that you might feel stressed? See if you can breathe into them for a minute. Feel your feet on the floor. Clear any confusion in your brain. Your breath is always there to just focus on. So focus on just the sound of your breath or the depth of your breath. And then we talked earlier, Beth and I, about like having being more of the observer. So if you're in a tense situation with your teen, that you're actually just in your centered space observing them, maybe also including that cute picture of them as a little kid and noticing that they're, there's something that they're struggling about with. There's something they're trying to figure out. There's something they're trying to communicate. And if it's mean to you, about you, you can always always say, I, I that feels mean. I I that hurt my feelings. But to really try to get in that centered space where you're not reacting to them, that you're actually pausing. And is there anything else you want to add about self-regulation tips um, for either noting your own self-regulation or noting when a teen is not regulated and how to help them get regulated? Beth, would you could you add something there? The analogy that I always like to give is, you know, when you have a toddler and teenagers can be a lot like toddlers, when you have a toddler and they're having a sort of tantrum, they're overtired, they're frustrated and they punt, they hit you, you know, so they'll sort of thump when they're angry. Let's say you pick them up and they're frustrated and they don't want to be picked up and they'll sort of, you don't hit back. You, you understand it's nap time or this task they were doing on the floor was too complicated or they're hungry because they miss snack. You understand and you lead with compassion on that. And you say, wait, you can't hit me. You set the limit and say, we don't hit each other. We never hit people. And you don't touch my body in ways that I don't like. And we do all those things that we know how to do as parents. But when a teenager does their version of that, which is some sort of verbal attack, mm -hmm. which is appropriate at times for teenagers to do, I always encourage parents to sort of get to use exactly as you described it, step back and take an observer stance the same way we do. Nobody likes to be punched by your two-year-old, but you don't jump in. You think, did they have a snack today? Why are they so tired? I wonder what's happening. Is this a growth stage? Are they teething? You run through your list of questions. I would encourage you to do the same with a teenager, which is step back and say, like, were they you know, at a sleepover last night and maybe stayed up for the entire night and are exhausted? Are they really frustrated about something that's happening in their other home? Mm -hmm. is, is Are their friends being horrible to them? Did their girlfriend, boyfriend just break up with them? What else is going on? And again, that doesn't mean you need to be the carrier of everything. You can say to them and should say to them, that was really mean. And I don't want to engage with you that way. Let's you know, step back for a second, but I know you wouldn't say that unless you were upset about something. I'm here if you want to talk about what's going on for you. Like, I'm always happy to listen and I'm here. Just let me know if you want to talk about anything else that's going on in your life. And it doesn't mean they're going to sort of calm down and say, oh yes, sure, let's do that. Mm -hmm. But at least they've heard you say that. And I think that's incredibly important in terms of being available to them and opening those lines of communication. And that starts with the act of stepping back and observing because this is where it's confusing for us as parents because they look like big people, sort of, and they talk like big people, like adults. We get confused and think they are, but they're really not. And that's where you have to really check yourself and step back and say, what they did was really not okay. The way when they were two and punched you, it's not okay. But my reaction needs to be tempered and intentional in the same way that it was when they were a toddler. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I like that, that thought that you said is like, can, maybe you can tell me in a little bit what, what's so intense right now, what's going on. That's so intense. Um, and sometimes the best thing to do is to step back time out. Well, we convene, let's eat something. Let's take a break. Let's come back in a little bit. It's always, I think harder in lots of ways when you have the withdrawn teenager that doesn't come out of their room and it's really hard to engage them, but it's almost like the same tactic of just of sitting around them being really centered yourself um, and keeping your own kind of routine going so that they, they, they have, they have a routine that's going on around them, that that life is still happening and that sort of checking in and seeing where you can have your in with them. But I think, you know, both things are extreme, right? The withdrawn teenager and the very um, impulsive uh, emotional teenager, both, both are, can be difficult in different ways. So difficult. And I I really want parents to remember also that it, teenagers moods are rapid cycling unlike adults and that's something that parents sometimes forget so they'll say you know my teenager was screaming at me or in their room being horribly you know rejecting and then an hour later they're happy and come into the kitchen and do i want to go to the mall with them don't take that personally teenagers don't move through moods the way adults do they move through it's called rapid cycling moods and they go very quickly so they can be up and down and up and down and doesn't mean that they're going crazy or that you're going crazy it's just another part of adolescence and i think the more you can bolster yourself with really understanding how the teenage brain works and how teenage development functions the better equipped you'll be as a parent to not right be sort of dysregulated by your teen's behavior Right. So the, in that example, I would think about the adult, the parent response might be like, I can't switch that fast. I, yeah. I need to have some kind of repair going on, or I need some kind of acknowledgement about what just happened. Um, and you know, how that is, is that sometimes you can't really talk about that thing right away because it all comes back really fast. Huh? If you talk about the tension or the argument. So you might say, yeah, but I, I at some point, I'm going to be just bringing back up what happened because we really do need to talk about that. But I will go along with that. You're in a different space and we're going to move along this day. But I think there's a note to self, like do come back and talk about the things that have been tense between you and your teen so that they're not just forgotten. And the rapid cycling isn't just, um, I can do this all the time and get away with it kind of thing. I do need to be responsible for other, the way I affect other people and the way I make other people feel. Yeah, that's exactly right. So in in that exact situation, my advice would be at the end of the hopefully fun trip to the mall or to the whatever it is that you're going to do after your teenager has, you know, eaten and went, if they haven't slept well, let them get a good night of sleep, get all other factors copacetic, and then sort of say to them, the interaction we had in your room really hurt my feelings. How can we do this better next time? And I think if you approach it with a, how can we do it better? Mm -hmm. And then say, I struggle with how quickly I know your moods turn around. And sometimes the words are really harsh and they hurt my feelings. What do you need from me in that moment? Mm -hmm. So that they're both aware. And it's not that you're over catering. They're aware that they did something that wasn't working from a relational perspective, but that you also want to hear what do they need from you so that they're not feeling purely reprimanded. Right. So we're going to move into the whole idea about vision of family and there's a lot in between that we haven't covered. And there's other opportunities for you to, to get some of the information. The other thing that we haven't covered was the whole idea about what's happening in the co-parenting relationship. How much are you communicating to the other co-parent about the rapid cycling moods of your of your teen? What's happening in their house? Um, is, it a, is it a positive influence on their mood when they're with you or a negative influence? Like all of those things are we're not we're not skimming we know they're there we know that they need to be discussed and we we've got that information for you so um just keep connected to us and you'll keep getting it um and you can you know always uh you know reach out to us differently if you have bigger issues going on in your family so the other part is the vision of family so i'm going to have you start that part out a little bit the vision of family actually yeah. i'll start it out cuz you yeah. did the line um so the vision of family is like we we also know that um, it's important for you to think back on when you decided you were going to create a family, you had a vision about what that was going to look like. And that vision changed. And so sometimes I think what happens is people get stuck in, I want, I, I long for some of that vision to come back. I want that vision to come back. I wanted to have my family raised this way to go through my child's high school graduation this way 
to have family vacations this way and it's changed. And I think the the holdback for teens a lot of times is that again, they're they're very influenced by how both parents move forward in their lives after a separation. They're very influenced by that. And it's that old saying is like, if you do okay, your kid's going to do better. Like they're going to do better. If you hold back and haven't done your own personal work and you're back in the past, and and we know lots of complicated things happen in long-term relationships that sometimes are unforgivable or non-negotiable, right? But there is still that healing that is important for you to do so that your child gets to move on, your teen gets to move on and not feel like they're sort of trapped in uh, the your your recovery from your marriage or or your um your depression from your marriage it's it's really important that that is something that you consider in yourself that's one thing you can give to your children or to your teen as you're moving forward in your life is to really heal in your life so that they get released from the the past relationship too um or the past marriage especially if it was brought attention to their childhood um so we know there's lots of different kinds of families. There's lots of different ways of doing things. And there's stressors that come with that. Like for a period of time, maybe you're single parenting your child, right? On the on your time. Maybe you're trying to um, create a new relationship for yourself. Maybe you're trying to blend a family. So we know there's stressors in that. And we're really wanting you to consider how to keep your child center again, your teen center, so that you consider how they're going through this as well as you're going through this. So the vision, new, your new vision of family has to include keeping your kid at center. Exactly. And I, and I want to add to that. I think that one of the things that happens is because there usually is so much conflict leading up to a separation or a divorce, people also get attached to that and habituated to that conflict. So part of it in the terms of the new family is what are the things that I can do to create a new vision of family that works for me? And also how can I just let go of the conflict? Like, you know, I, I see things like where say a couple, when they were married, will disagree and fight endlessly about, for example, bedtime for the kids um, or curfew times for the teenager, whatever the thing is that that became sort of a subject which they would butt heads on constantly. Post-divorce, they'll continue butting heads on it when the truth is they have no real say over what happens to the child in the other home it, on, if they can't agree, if they can agree, great. But if it's really just perpetuating conflict, and then checking in with your kid. What time did mom or dad make you go to bed? Or what, you know, that's an example of just letting it go and having your new family rituals and your new family rules be just yours and let them do their other thing at the parent, the other parent's house so that you're not putting your child in the middle. You're putting your child in the center by understanding that at different homes, there are going to be different rules and you may not like the other rules, but that that conflict about those particular rules needs to be part of the previous family structure. So sometimes there's good things from previous family structures, like, oh, we all used to spend like Hanukkah together, or we all used to do Easter bunnies together or whatever. That can adapt, but so can a lot of the conflict be let go. You know, both negative and positive things from prior family structure can be released. Right. And we're we're also knowing that we're not skimming through like safety concerns, right? That there are sometimes safety concerns in the other house. Are they being supervised enough? Um, and so we, we, we don't want to skim on that at all, but we do want you to come into the frame of, for the, for the exercise, the thing to reflect on is what is your vision of your family currently? And there may be like, you might want to write a list of, and this is the challenges of my new vision, right? Because I'm still bumping up against that other parent. Um, so there are challenges in this vision and, and to reflect for a minute on what what are some of the things like that are neutral to positive that are the new things or traditions that are happening in your family? Like, oh, it's not so bad. And what are the areas that you feel like you, you're going to have to go into maybe acceptance more so that you can kind of come up to speed with what your teen needs from you in the new vision of the family? That's a big question, like what they need from you, what their personality needs from you. Yeah, and how you can find it outside of the prior family structure, right? So let's say it's that you really develop closer relationships with family friends or with distant family that you don't normally see that much. How can you sort of integrate your other resources into your life that maybe you had under relied upon when you were still in your marriage? Mm -hmm. And your your thought about this exercise was like, um, 
how not to bring the conflict that was in the marriage into the new vision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. did we say fixing the other person's, the other parent's home, <laughs> fixing the things that are wrong in it. I mean, that's what I see in terms of the holding on to the conflict and how to really create that separation. And again, always the caveat, if there's actually something that you perceive to be dangerous happening in the other home, you have to call your lawyer call child protective, of course, but often it's you. And in fact, usually not that stuff. It's usually disagreements over parenting styles. And so to really practice, just letting that stuff go and understanding mm -hmm. you only control what you can control in your own home. Right. Or disagreements on whoever the new adult is in the home and how they're engaging with the, with the teen. Yeah. Right? Meaning new partners. Is that what you mean? New partners. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that that again becomes trying to control the uncontrollable and by trying to control what happens in your, in their other parents' house, you are putting your child in the middle and creating conflict because inevitably, if you think about it for a second, if you don't like your child being around your ex-partner's new spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, how awkward that must be for your child who then has to feel an obligation to report back to you about who was around on which day when, who was included in which family celebration and who was not, what did that new partner actually do that's going to upset, the, you know, it becomes this horrible burden on the child to be. But to there's another angle to it is, especially with the teen, is to, to encourage the teen to use their own voice about it. So that might mean that you have to do that observer role and allow them to come into that frame of like, what is, what is it going to be healthy for them and to listen to that. And then also always distinguish like, is that manipulation or is that really um, the thing that they need to be encouraged to actually say to the other parent? Like, I don't want to, to spend so much time with that other, your, your partner on my own without you there or whatever it is. Um, so there's, there's a way to encourage the voice, um, the strengthening voice of the team. And I think that goes to sort of basic communication skills of really listening well, validating. So if your teen comes and says, oh, it's so annoying when I'm at dad's house, for example, like this new girlfriend is always there and I can't stand her and I just want time alone with him. I would validate that and say, that must be really hard. And have you tried talking to your dad about that? But that doesn't mean that you then need to jump in and go and fix that other environment. That's your child's relationship with their other parent. And I think that you need to edify your child in terms of listening to them and in giving them communication skills to talk about it and say, you know, would this be accurate if I described it this way or trying to help them understand. And I would do emotional identification with them. So what's the feeling that it brings up? Does it feel, are your feelings hurt that, you know, your dad's not prioritizing mm -hmm. you? Does it feel abandoning? Does it feel, and this is not about criticizing the other parent. It's really about helping your child to put some language to what the feeling is and also letting them know that you see them. You know, we talked mm -hmm. before in the podcast a bit about mirroring. Teenagers need mirroring too. They need to know that you see that it's hard. And sometimes by the way, that unto itself is actually a solution. Them mm -hmm. just being able, to, them knowing that you see that it's hard for them at their other parent's house and them being given some language in which to think about it and maybe hopefully even talk about it is often 90% of the battle. Right. So we're going to go into summary now. And I, I think we have to do sort of the top few things that we each think about in terms of how to summarize it. My summary is based on our exercises that we did, that I really want you to keep thinking about your why and what you're struggling with and to, to stay focused on it. Because I know when we focus on something, it can change, right? The other, the other part of that is your own self-regulation to think about your own orientation about how you grew up and how your ideas about family need to change as well as just considering how your co-parent thinks about that. Um, your new vision for yourself and your kid. And, um, and I think part of it is just like really working on that bond. That would be my summary. It was really working on that bond with your teen. And my summary would be all of those things as well. In addition <laughs> to educate yourself about adolescence we don't all intuitively know. So really learn actually what's going on for your adolescent and what do they need from you. Um, ground yourself, the self, that's what you talked about in terms of self-regulation and the way that I view that is also to allow yourself to take this observer stance, to really step back and, and look at what's going on without um, engaging in conflict with your, with your teenager unnecessarily. And I would also reframe some of your sadness and your grief about what's been lost in your old family structure into, as you put it very well, neutral or positive versions. What are the really good and exciting ways in which your family can move forward that may be different than what you had originally envisioned? Mm -hmm.
Great. It's always great to talk to you, Beth. There's so much information to share with you. So thanks again for all your efforts to, to put this webinar together with me and to be here. It's I really so exciting. It. We have more upcoming webinars, which there's so much more to yeah. talk about. So very much looking forward. Okay, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed that and um, we hope to hear from you soon. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.